So if you're anything like me and a bit of a nerd when it comes to investing in personal finance, or maybe you're just starting out and wondering what's the best investment portfolio and what should it look like, then you're in the right place because in this video, I'm gonna go through eight different investing portfolios and look at everything from their overall performance, how they've done in the past up until today, what their risks are, including their lowest lows and worst years, and then give my thoughts on what might be the one right for you and some of my top tips through the years. So what are the different portfolios we're going to look at? Well, in summary, we aren't going to pick individual stocks and shares. We're making these with index funds across the wider stock market. Remember that index funds are just collections of companies brought together into one place that you can invest in. And they include some of the most popular and famous indices on the planet, like the S&P 500, or even global funds, which let you pretty much invest and own every publicly traded company in the world. Here are the eight different portfolios we'll look at. I'll pop these up on screen now so we can all just take a look. And what we'll do is go back as far as we can in history, or at least as far as the data allows for the fund or the ETF. As if you didn't know already, index funds and especially exchange traded funds haven't actually been around for all that long. And it's only been the last several decades which have made them really popular with retail investors like you and me. Right, let's get stuck into these portfolios. First up, the trusty S&P 500, which is a favorite with many investors all over the world because it gives you access to some of the largest companies, including the likes of Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Tesla, and many, many more. And more importantly, it provides you with a really high level of diversification, which is super important when building out a portfolio. Let's look at some figures, and I'm actually gonna put up the first three portfolios here at the same time, as this will make things a lot more interesting. So to take us through all this, we're gonna use something called the portfolio backtesting tool. And now the rules are pretty simple. We're gonna put in $10,000, which could easily just be 10,000 pounds, 10,000 of whatever currency you want in as early as we can as a lump sum and just let it ride and see what happens. Oh, and one more thing, of course, we're gonna reinvest any dividends. So any small dividends we get paid, we wanna have them reinvested. This is purely driven for as much growth as we can. So. Coming up first, we're gonna pick the S&P 500. We're gonna use the old mutual fund from Vanguard. Then we're gonna look at the US total stock market as a second benchmark. And on our third one, we're gonna do a bit of a 60-40 split, the old classic investment of the total US stock market at 60% and then made up of a global bond fund at 40%. So let's go through and see what these first three funds actually look like. We've got three portfolios up in front of us. You'll see that these red and blue lines, which are portfolios one and two, are very closely correlated. So this is our S&P 500 and our total US stock market. So there's gonna be very few differences really between the two if we think of what it's made up of. The S&P 500, of course, is the biggest companies in the US. And of course, they do make up most of the investable equity space in the US. And then everything else, those smaller and mid-cap companies, although they can grow quicker, they're only a lot smaller companies. So one of the most interesting things here is we've got a good amount of data here, which goes all the way back to around 1993 when some of these funds were actually created. So this is a good, definitely investment timescale from today. So 20 to end of 2021, start of 2022, back all the way to 1994. So you would have hoped your money has grown by then. So first observation then, there is no surprise here that portfolio number three, the one with the bonds in it, hasn't done as well as the two other pure equity funds. I don't think there's any necessarily a surprise there. However, this is just up until today. Let's look at some of the more details to actually take us through why this has happened. If we go through here, we can see portfolios one and two from a compounded annual growth rate. So that's our CAGR, or however you want to say it, been pretty impressive. Over that time period, you've had over a 10% return on your money, which if someone could give me that for the next 20 years, I would bite their hand off immediately. And you've also seen portfolio one and two very closely correlated as well. Their best years have been very similar. Their worst years have been very similar. But look at this max drawdown. So the max drawdown is any given period, it could be a week or two or a day even, what's the maximum your portfolio is going to get hit? So this is the one which you have to ask yourself. The difficult question is, could you stand a 51% drop in your portfolio and still keep investing? And be honest with yourself, I think a lot of us would have a very difficult time doing that. However, now here's when the big comparison comes in and where bonds have historically been a really good use and blending and a balancing of our portfolio. So portfolio number three, although the growth hasn't been quite as exciting and you've missed out on quite a lot of growth, especially toward the tail end of this peak, your growth rate has still been relatively respectable, 8.5%. Again, I know a lot of people would probably take that. Your worst year, however, has not been anywhere near as bad as portfolio one and two at just minus 20%. So you're still going to take a hit like the rest of the market. You can't escape it. But your max drawdown as well, which is probably the most significant thing here. Again, I say only negative 30% when everyone else is rushing around and nearly lost half of their portfolios. 
And of course, if we just look on the graph and see roughly when this happened, we'll see when the bonds kind of come into play and help us out. And they've really smoothed out that graph a lot. So, for example, if we look at you know a real significant crash like the financial crisis, we'll see here right down there at the bottom, February the 28th, 2009, we would have seen portfolio one and two down there at $22,000, while our portfolio number three has nearly 15% more or so at $25,000. All of your friends invested in just stocks are going to be suffering on those ones. Now, we'll also see really that it's only been during the last kind of a decade or so when really there's been a differential. So we see around the 2011 mark and the 2012s, those three portfolios have been really similar. It's only been during this crazy unprecedented bull run we've had over the past kind of 10 or so years where stocks have really taken off and bonds have kind of gone out the window. So very, very interesting on this first portfolio. OK, let's bring up our next contenders. Again, we're going to be pitting the S&P 500 and keeping that as our benchmark throughout. But we've got two more different portfolios here that we're adding in. So we're going to actually now add in the small cap stocks in the US and then we're going to have a small cap and bond blend. Again, that's 60 40 mix, but you could go as crazy as you want and change that to any percentage. Now let's have a look at results. I suspect without running this one before that we're going to see a similar thing, but let's get into it. So interesting enough, we're going to see some much bigger figures here because we've got a bit more data on these funds. Now we can actually go back to, wow, 1987. So just before I was born in 1988. So an interesting thing here. So reminder, Bond one is our reference bond here, I guess our benchmark of the S&P 500. So that still is the winner here with $373,000 of final balance with a really nice growth rate of above 10% at 10.84. So coming up in just a very close second, and this is just up to today's values, who knows what's going to happen next, is our small cap stock index. Now, if we zoom in a bit here on some of the parts of these graphs, we will see that the portfolios one and two were pretty close to each other. And actually, it's only really been the last few years here, the last few months, certainly, where we saw a massive divergence and some of those big tech companies have really swallowed up those little ones. Now, what's interesting here is I would have really have liked to see those small cap stocks and that small cap fund kind of outperform our big S&P 500 brothers and sisters in kind of every metric here, but maybe be a bit more volatile. But actually, what we've seen is it's been slightly more volatile but hasn't necessarily given us back the same returns. Again, let's now look not at the graph, but some of the numbers here. Again, its best year would beat the S&P 500 at 45% increase in a year. Its worst year is very similar, but it has had a max drawdown of nearly 54% against even a 51% of the S&P 500. And again, our portfolio three, which mixes in bonds with that, can reduce the maximum level of drawdown you see, level off your kind of worst year that you might experience and make your heart rate go not so high. So by adding those bonds in your portfolio, you really are just reducing that level of volatility here and smoothing things out. And again, if we go back to our chart, especially during those periods of crisis, you'll see how correlated our portfolios are. At the end of the day, they've all got equities in, so any single crash we have, we'll always see them going down. I think Peter Lynch said that once, that every single time he had a crash, his portfolio went down, so he wins. OK, now quickly some more fun portfolios. So we're going to put up the Boglehead three fund special against the Ray Dalio all weather fund. Some quite interesting ones here. So a couple of bits of background on this one. So the Boglehead one, really simple three fund portfolio. You're looking at US market, you're looking at an international fund and a bond fund as well to smooth that out. And that's on a 50, 20, 30 split. And then portfolio three is the famous Ray Dalio's all weather, all season fund. Now, this fund is really designed not necessarily to grow and going all out growth. It's really to protect and preserve capital for, you know, institutional investors or investors who maybe have a lot of money and don't really want to see their portfolios drop 40, 50 percent throughout a year. So you'll see that it's actually invested in different things like gold, different commodities and actually a good chunk of a long term treasury bonds as well. So 40 percent of the portfolio is in the iShares 20 plus year treasury bonds. And then the rest of it, 30 percent is in the total stock market. So this one's be quite interesting. I think we're going to see and we're still going to have our benchmark here of the S&P 500 with the VFINX, Vanguard's 500 index. But we'll be interested to see how smooth good old Dalio's fund can be. 
So a quick look at the graphs and the numbers, we will see we're only going back to about 2007. So it's still a long term period, but it's not a crazy amount, a long amount of time. We will see that Portfolio 3, Ray Dalio's or Weather Fund in that gold line. I would say it's probably the most smooth, if you could probably call it that. And actually, if you go through some of the figures here, you will see that it's done what it's promised to do. So its worst year is actually an incredible performance of only minus 3.63%. So you'd be very happy when some of your peers were minus 37%. And the max drawdown you would have seen your worst point it's been 11.98%. So that's very impressive indeed. And you still managed to get a compounded annual growth rate of one better than that portfolio number two. And at least again, during that period of time, that's always a caveat to say this is just during up to current time from 2007. Very, very interesting. Of course, still trumped by the good old S&P 500 with that nearly 10% annual growth rate. But of course, you've got the volatility that comes with it. So as long as you can take those, you'll get the rewards in the end. But again, who knows what this graph is going to look like in the next 20 to 30 years? That's a really interesting one. I'll just leave this one up quickly here so you can see the codes that I'm using and the ticker symbols. Bear in mind, these are the American ones, so we would need to try and translate these into some UK ones that we can. But I'll leave these allocations up on screen now. Right. And we'll get to the final one. And the final one, just a bit of fun here, guys, is S&P 500 up against the FANG stocks. I just put all the FANG stocks in 20 percent of your portfolio in each of the one. So $2,000 and we'll go back to as far as we can go back. Now it's only 2013 we can go back to because that is when Facebook actually floated on the stock market, which is now Meta Platforms. So no surprise here really, but going back to individual stock picking, would you have picked those stocks and would you have foreseen the last few years and the growth? Would you have held on and would you have not sold? All these questions to be ringing alarm bells. But quick look at the facts here. Huge amount of best year here on Portfolio 2 with those individual FANG stocks going over 100% in a year. That is just phenomenal. Of, but of course, though, more volatile. Max drawdown, minus 25%, and the worst year of minus 18%. So again, can you go through the periods of minus 18% and take 100% as your best year? Let's wait and see. But a compound annual growth rate of 34%. Pretty impressive. So after all of that, what's the best portfolio? Well, as you've seen, each of these is different use cases. So a lot of this answer will depend on where you are in life, how long you have left to invest and what your level of risk appetite is. As we've seen from almost every portfolio, there will be some years and some points in the portfolio where you can be down 30, 40 or even 50 percent. And you'll have to ask yourself that difficult question if you would actually be OK with that. And even if you think you will, you better believe that once you actually experience it, it's very different from just an idea. Many thousands of investors out there, millions of investors have never actually really experienced a proper bear market or crash. And I'd include myself in that one for certain. Even 2020 was just a flash in the pan in hindsight. And sure, we're now seeing a pretty rough start to 2022 with growth stocks being hammered. But ultimately, if you follow some of the sound investing principles, you should be OK. Generally speaking, the younger you are, the longer your time scales, so you can ride out the ups and downs and in theory, go 100% stocks, ignore the bonds and just keep investing through the good times and the bad. And this shows when we look at indexes like the S&P 500. But all that's easier said than done. And also it doesn't take into consideration when you want to retire or maybe even start to draw down from this portfolio. I'm only measuring the performance up to today. So it's biased toward those people who need the money right now. And none of us know what will happen in the future. Also, it's worth noting that we're in a strange period of record low interest rates, possibly on the way up, huge levels of quantitative easing and the creation of government debt to fund our recent global pandemic recovery. And now we've just entered into a world where war is on the doorstep of Europe and we might see a deglobalization of the East and the West with supply chains fragmented and commodity prices through the roof. There's no saying what's going to happen next. So you've got to ask yourself and find what works for you. Ask yourself those difficult questions about how you're going to be able to handle the downturns and then stick with the plan. Now, that's the hardest bit for sure. And it's easy to quit and call it a day. I know I've done it too many times. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Feel free to check out this next one where I look at some of the best index funds and ETFs for UK investors, which might help you out if you're looking to build a portfolio similar to any of the ones that you might have seen. Also, drop me a like, subscribe for more. I'll see you in the next one. But as always, happy investing.